Thank you, Timber, for that very, uh, very kind, very generous uh, introduction. And to Jason and the Free Market Foundation, once again, for inviting me. Um, I cannot say no to the Free Market Foundation because, um, because I'm free. Um, and I also don't smoke. Um, and my mouth is privatized as well. So whatever will come out of my mouth is, is private. So, and please respect my privacy uh, as I speak to you as well. So what I'd like to do in the next uh, uh, 20 or so minutes is just um, give you a perspective on why it's important to respect intellectual property. Uh, even when what you're trying to do uh, is really for the benefit of poor people, if that's what you want to, uh, to focus on. And I think it's, sometimes it's quite misleading is when people, uh, somebody being kind uh, or generous has nothing to do with the ideology. It's got everything to do with who they are as individuals. And I think that sometimes it's a misconception when people portray themselves as, as um, uh, humanists or, or, or whatever. I don't want to offend anyone with a comment on ideology. Um, but I think it's often that we, we, we miss a point because we don't really see the bigger picture uh, of, of, of what we do. So this is just, uh, oops, what have I done? Um, oh, there we go. All right, so I'm hoping to touch on uh, these four aspects of my presentation. I'll kick off and, uh, and tell you why, although there are benefits that one can derive from generic medications, that has, has its own limitations uh, and it's not sustainable. Uh, and so when we talk about um, anything that's new, a new disease, we have to think about innovation because that's exactly uh, is the point. Secondly, um, I will take the example of why intellectual property rights are important. Uh, and I'm going to use the example of uh, pharmaceuticals because that's a space that uh, I, I work in. Uh, and then uh, I'll tell you very briefly about um, our Drug Discovery Center uh, and why IP is important to what we do. Uh, and also why it's important because that's what allows us to um, give confidence to the people that support us, uh, that we can protect the IP, uh, and you'll see this when we talk about what we work on. And then I'll finish off uh, very quickly with showing you um, an example, an example of what happens when you respect intellectual property and you focus on uh, that um, and how that can really attract uh, investment. This is a simple example, but I think it tells uh, a very powerful story. All right, I go back to the point I made earlier. Generics are not a sustainable solution to things. I mean, I understand the argument for, for generics, but let me give you a simple example. When we talk about drug resistance, what does it mean? So this could be a drug or a medicine for cancer. That we can, never, we can no longer use this drug for cancer because the cancer cells have developed resistance um, to that drug, which means any generic medication that was developed to treat can that particular cancer will be rendered useless, and that cancer would not be treated. Okay, So the generic medication will just um, tip over. So. Even with known diseases, we have new forms of the same diseases that have plagued us, whether it's a TB, whether it's um, HIV, whether it's cancer. Resistance is a natural consequence of, of chemotherapy. So therefore, we always have to think about unmet medical needs, which actually require innovation. And the question is, how do we incentivize innovation? So that's the first point, that to sustain anything, we have to keep innovating. Um, and I think we heard from the first speaker of just the whole time frame of, of telephones uh, and how things have changed uh, in, in, a, in a decade. So research and development, as I'll show you at the end of my talk, is not a luxury, okay? It's expensive, but I don't think anything is cheap. Um, but also the benefits that come from it far, far outweigh uh, what investment uh, is there if there's success. And of course, I stand here not because I'm a government employee, but this is not just the responsibility of government. Um, um, this is about a public-private partnership. Uh, and so it's not just about government and expecting government to do everything, um, but it's also the, the private sector to play its role uh, in partnering with government. But of course, government's responsibility 
uh, is to make sure that um, it provides that conducive environment, including providing incentives uh, to encourage people to take part in innovation. What about pharmaceuticals? And I'll keep this very simple and to the point. So what you see on this drugs is talking about patents. I think we heard from Boneni, uh, he said, um, patents, intellectual property is not patents, but patents are intellectual property, okay? Now, why is it important, for example, for a new drug? Just, just for the sake of argument, this could apply to anything that's new. Why is it important to secure intellectual property um, on a new medicine? It's obvious, we don't live like animals in a jungle. It's not a law of the jungle. Uh, it's a rule of law that needs to be respected. So that if there's any violation of that rule, uh, there's a recourse to, uh, to the rule of law in case of any infringements. And you see why it's important in, in the example I'll give you why it's so important that for you to attract investment, to take something forward, is really people want to see that there's freedom to operate, that they're not actually prevented from operating and commercializing a product uh, because of their, they don't have uh, intellectual property uh, secured. Everything we do in life is risky. Even today, now I understand that sitting down is risky. It's as bad as smoking. Uh, maybe from now onwards, I'll be standing in my office and not uh, sitting down. But the po point is that this business is very risky, yeah? It's very, very high risk, but also very high reward. The attrition rate as you go from discovery to commercialization is very high. It's very extremely high. But we talk about human health or animal health, whatever health that we're focusing on, there are risks that one has to take. So therefore, it's not just someone looking to share in the benefits. It's also sharing the risks. So if we want to share benefits, we must be prepared to share the risks as well. And that's why it needs to be public-private partnership. It's not just waiting to benefit. It's also to get involved and share the risks. So what you see here is a simple message here. Whether you like it or not, this is something we do every day. Firstly, it takes a very long time. On average, 10 to 15 years, if you are successful, if you are successful, and if you have all the resources that you need to move from one phase to the next. This is not a joke. This is not anyone making up numbers. This is a reality. And there comes a time when you get into clinical development, for example, where there are no shortcuts. You have to do things the way they are supposed to be done. And that takes a certain amount of time. Okay, so it takes long and it's very expensive. That is a message here. People, we can argue and debate about how much. That's not my point. My point is it's expensive and it takes long. In fact, we say in drug discovery, you have to kiss many frogs before you meet the prince. Why is this? So it's what we call the valley of death. So what you see on the left is the discovery part. And what you see on the extreme right is the phase three human clinical trials. Most projects, most projects fail here. They don't even get out of the discovery block, they fail. This is what we call the value of death. Someone, someone has to pay for those failures. Who is going to pay for those failures? And if things fail, who, ben who doesn't benefit? Who loses out? It's a patient. We often focus on saying, oh, they want to make money. They want to price this medication so they make money. Well, that's one side of the coin, then what's wrong with making money? Um, but secondly, importantly, it's about access to that medicine by the patient. So when something fails, this is purely research. If something fails, then we deny the patient access to a life-changing medication. So this is the message here is that this is what we call the value of death. And when things fail, you never get to hear about them. And somebody, somebody has to pay for those failures. It costs money to do discovery as you see uh, a little bit later. All right, so this, how do we navigate this value of death? This is really about what I referred to earlier. It's about partnerships, public-private partnerships, or in this space, 
we call it uh, product development partnerships, uh, because you cannot do it alone. We have to partner in everything that we do. All right, very, very briefly, let me just introduce you to our Drug Discovery Center, because this is important for what I'm going to tell you a little bit later. So we got started really in April of 2011. Um, and the idea was really how do we build, how do we bridge the gap between the clinics, the clinical trials or, 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 or the clinical research on one extreme and the basic science. So you have two extremes in South Africa or actually the entire continent. Is the one extreme uh, is clinical. In fact, there's a perception out there um, that Africa is a place where you can only do clinical trials. You cannot innovate, okay? So this is a gap, this is a chasm between the lab and the hospital. How do we bridge this gap and provide translational aspects of the basic science that happens in our universities? And also importantly, not just bridging this chasm and this gap, how do we contribute to creating jobs? People are desperate for jobs. Our young people are unemployed, the majority of them. We, we tell them to go to school, but where is the job that they're going to go to? And if we don't pull this in the right direction, how are we going to attract people to, let's say, whatever industry, to science, if they cannot see a job at the end of the day? And I'll show you how we're trying to contribute, not to blame, but to do what we can to make a difference uh, in our environment. So we got started, um, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later. Um, the team is about 90 people in a space of six years. We've grown from uh, five people that I used to have uh, to about uh, more than 60 people uh, in H3D uh, together with the uh, academic group. We had integrated uh, platform across uh, 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 two campuses on the UCD campus uh, in the Department of Medicine. Uh, this is a medical school and this is the chemistry department up on, on upper campus. So it's really integrated. This is what you require to really prosecute a project from the lab and move it towards the clinic. And that's what we've created um, uh, in, in Cape Town. I won't bore you with the details. What this slide is really summarizing here is the program that we're involved in. So we've chosen as a start, you've got to start from somewhere. We had to build infrastructure from scratch. There was no drug discovery that was happening in this country before we started. When I say drug discovery, the way it ought to be done in an integrated way with all the enabling technologies and platforms and the expertise that you need to move things forward. So we had to build and we had to start from somewhere. So it's not about a disease. It's about how do we build a drug discovery engine or expertise that because the skills are transferable. Today you're working on TB, tomorrow you're working on cancer. So what we focus on, focus is really important. Show that you can do something with what you have without wishing you had everything. So we focus on malaria. Uh, this is the so-called antimicrobial resistance. This is really addressing uh, these bugs that have become resistant to uh, conventional antibiotics. Uh, and also uh, TB is one of the other areas as well. I won't bore you with the other stuff uh, here, but just to get you focused on what we do, and I'll come back to this on subsequent slides. All right, what about IP? IP, we are focused on TB and malaria. Why should we care about IP? Is it important? Of course it is important. It's important for the following uh, three reasons. First of all, people tend to focus on rights, yeah, intellectual property rights. And when people react to people who own intellectual properties because they think that they'll make money uh, and exploit, I don't know why people think it's anything wrong with making money. Um, but actually, I want to tell you that this is not just about intellectual property rights. It's a responsibility that you have. The moment you file a patent, the clock starts ticking, okay? You have a responsibility to move that innovation, that product to the patient. That responsibility is extremely serious because you've got to make sure you have all the resources you need and the partnerships to move that product to the patient. People often would file a patent so they can publish. So you find actually, I might quote wrong statistics here, there are so many people in this country that file so-called patents. And they can count them. And they'll tell you they have 100 patents. And if you look at those patents, they're pretty meaningless. Because they sit there, they don't know how to move them forward. They don't know they have a responsibility. And the only reason why they take a patent is so they can publish. 
but there's no mechanism to move that forward. Intellectual property is not just a right, it's a responsibility. And when you file a patent, you have the responsibility to move that forward so that the patient can benefit at the end of that process. So yes, even when you work on TB or malaria, intellectual property is important because it's a responsibility and you have a responsibility to the patient. Second point is whether you like it or not, when you start going into clinical development, the amount of money that's involved in doing clinical trials and clinical research is enormous compared to what you spend on discovery. So inevitably, you are going to have to need partnerships or people that are gonna invest in taking that product from discovery all the way through the clinical trials. So you will need partners. Whether you like it or not, you will need partners. Otherwise, forget it, forget it. And that's why in the space that I operate in, the industry is not your enemy. Your, the industry is your partner. And you have to understand this, that if you, if you want to move things forward for the benefit of the patient, for the benefit of the poor patient, you need partnerships that allow you to move a product. Now companies don't want to come into arrangements where they don't have any freedom to operate. Um, they don't have any freedom to operate because there is no IP that is secured. Okay, so it's really important. Again, it's a benefit of the patient. If the project doesn't move, the patient has no access to that medication. So before I leave this slide, the key messages here really for me are twofold. One, you have to secure intellectual property so that you can shepherd that for the benefit of the patient at the end of the day. Secondly, to ensure that there's freedom to operate when you bring partners into the program so they can invest to move the program forward. Let me move uh, uh, to my last two slides or so. This is just a snapshot. Now I'm focusing on what are the benefits of not just doing research and development. What are the benefits when you respect intellectual property rights that you attract partners? Because they know that they will be able to operate under the rule of law uh, that it, before you start anything, the lawyers from the University of Cape Town and the lawyers from whichever is a partner or funder discuss and come to a mutual agreement. This is a slide showing you how we've grown in 2011 with five people to today to 660 people. 66 people in six, seven years is a remarkable progress. And, and I'll show you on the next slide. These are, these are direct jobs with different partnerships, industry, government, and philanthropic uh, entities, all coming together to grow something that didn't exist to something that's a major player, not just in Africa, but globally in the discovery space. Now I told you about 66 direct jobs that we have over the last five years or so. But we never, never focus on the other jobs that get created on the back of innovation. And this is a slide that is really summarized here. This really came out of a study commissioned by the Technology Innovation Agency, TIA. We can argue about the numbers and the sticks, but the principles are correct. So I spoke about the direct jobs. I spoke about growing the center from five people to 66 people. But what we also do, we spend the money here when we attract it. 70% of our budget is now international. 30% is local. We also create indirect jobs because we spend the money here. We have to buy our chemicals and everything else are here. And the people that we hire from wherever they come, they go and eat, shop from Woolies or pick and pay. Um, um, hopefully they don't eat from steers, but anyway, they eat from steers um, and, um, and they cook and they drive cars. So it's really important not to just focus on the direct jobs. They are also indirect jobs and they're also induced jobs. So this is like, if we have 60 jobs, uh, there'll be another 120 that are created directly or induced. So this is a really important message uh, that I'd like to leave with you. This is my final slide. There's often a tension, and I know uh, this could be industry here, it could be uh, the Department of Trade and Industry, or whoever it is that's focused on manufacturing. Manufacturing, 
yeah, the invention, when you invent a cell phone, uh, then it's mass produced in China. The question is, how do you get to manufacture? What are you going to manufacture? Who gives you the right to manufacture what you're going to manufacture? So this slide is really showing you, this is the research and development value chain, okay? From the left to the right, where you go from a discovery to when you register the medication, okay? That's the value chain. It doesn't matter whether you're working on TB or cancer. The point is this, that the research and development, which is really, really critical because of respect for intellectual property, you bring in resources that allow you to do the research and development. That value chain constantly interacts with the manufacturing value chain. Here's the opportunity not only to create jobs, but to create new industries, new opportunities. Here's an example. When you discover a drug, before it enters human clinical trials, you go from the laboratory scale to the kilogram scale. Someone, someone, not me in the university, someone has to come up with a way of producing the material for clinical trials on a large scale. That's an opportunity for companies to be formed so they can do what we call process chemistry or, or scale up chemistry. And, and, but they'll be reliant on the opportunities created by the discovery here. So you can look at the clinical trials uh, platform, but even when the drug is eventually um, um, registered, then companies can be created to manufacture that product. And look at the value chain and look at the jobs that are gonna be created here. If we respect intellectual property, we invest in research and development to fuel the pipeline. It's naive that you can just focus on manufacturing here. What are you gonna manufacture? What? Where is that going to come from? Who is going to give you the right to manufacture? Unless intellectual property is secured, you then can be given the right to manufacture that product. I really want to emphasize this. This is not about people trying to make money. It's about people taking responsibility and also creating jobs. Our young people need jobs. Let's throw away the rhetoric and the ideologies and really accept what is happening elsewhere, that we have to respect rights, whether it's intellectual property, so that we can bring in the investment that is needed to grow the economy and give jobs to our people. Thank you very much.